Hello. Hi, is this Misty? Yes, it is. All right. Well, let me do the official introduction, ladies and gentlemen. We are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. She is an actress, a writer, a director, and in addition to talking to us about her career, she's going to be talking to us about her new book, Misty Memories. We are very excited to welcome the one and only Misty Rowe to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome, Misty. Well, thank you. Hello, Carrie. Hello, Tiffany. <laughs> I want you to know that you're the girl most likely to be caught in a cornfield with, but it's all good, clean fun. We just stand up and tell jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what I think you don't know is I have my very own cornfield. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I keep it in a shed at my house, and when I go on the road, it goes in the back of my Jeep, and it goes with me. Oh, that's a wow. Not not since right. not since I heard the Beach Boys used to bring sand and spread it all over the studio floor <laughs> when they did recordings to, to fill the mood, and you do the same thing in a way. Yes, yes, I took it to Virginia for the PBS special because <laughs> they had a two-hour PBS special uh, of Cornfield Friends celebrating Hee Haw's 50 years. Wow. Well, I have to tell you that I'm envious, not not only because that's just a cool, fun fact, but I've never been able to get anything to grow, Misty. So the fact that you're able to keep that going <laughs> in and of itself. <laughs> so is it right that uh, you live on the East Coast? Uh, was it true that you did at one time or, or do live in, in a mountain uh, cabin? Or uh, Oh, yes, I've had a mountain cabin up in Lake Arrowhead. Wow. And I had a home in Big Bear Lake for 10 years. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And I had a home in the Hollywood Hills, and I had a house in Topanga Canyon. I, I have bought and sold uh, 10 houses in my lifetime. Wow. Because, you know, actors don't work all yeah. the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing about you is you've been lucky to have worked a lot. To know that you were on Hee Haw for 19 years, that's kind of unheard except for soap opera stars. Usually they're on for, like, forever. But to know that you were 19 years with a show, that's incredible. Oh, but I did marry a soap opera star. I heard, but, but I, I was on, I was on Hee Haw longer than I was married to him. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I heard. So you you married a dumbass that left you. I, I can't believe this. Why would anybody leave you? I I married a very sweet man who was waiting tables. I met him in acting school, and then he became a soap opera star. And you know, life changes yeah. and people change. That's true. And uh, we do have a daughter together. Her name is Dreama. Wow, I love and that name. She, thank you. It means hope. Yeah. And she was born in the year of the woman. There in you 1992. go. So she, it was her idea that I would write a book about my life and career and all the pe fabulous people I work with and also the ups and downs. And, you know, even with everything that went on in my life, it's a very colorful book, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess she was working away from home and, and wound up being home in the uh, epidemic hit, you know, the pandemic, and uh, basically had the idea that you should do the book, because I guess, and it was sad to hear that, that I guess Alzheimer's runs in your family, and she said if you ever had that and forgot anything, you'd have the book to remind you. Yes, she would read it to me. My mother had... Alzheimer's for 14 years. Oh, I'm sorry. And she lived with me for part of it. She didn't care. She didn't think she had it. She was very happy. It didn't bother her. It bothered everyone else yeah. around her. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I actually wrote a play that will be coming out when the pandemic is over mm -hmm. called Forget Me Not. Wow. Mm. And it's a memoir of my mother's uh, journey through Alzheimer's. Yeah. Which is very funny in places and sad in others, but I wrote it because it took me through a journey, too. You know, I had been on television and movies, and I came from very humble beginnings, and my mom was always there for me. Yeah. And then when my husband left, she was really there for me. She helped me with my baby, and then she got Alzheimer's. Wow. So then I had a child, and I had a mother with Alzheimer's. So a lot of things in my uh, career were put on hold for a while. Well, you're and definitely then, a strong woman, that's for sure. Go ahead. 
I, I'm not strong because I wanted to be. Yeah. It's just someone had to take care of a child and a, and a mother with Alzheimer's. And you deal with things. It's, it's not the life um, that you had hoped for. But, you know, there are blessings along the way. Yes. Because you meet people that help you, that inspire you. And not everybody has a happy life. Right. But I, I, I've had great parts of my life that were very happy. Yeah. I guess, unfortunately, you even lost a child once, right? Yeah. 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 Sad. His name was Paul. Um, and I actually did a documentary, um, uh, and uh, Naomi Watts uh, narrated it. It was only for people who had lost their children. Mm. And... Um, it was a, a trying time, but you know, when you talk to people about things that happened to you and they share what happened to them, um, I, I think it helps you through life. And that's why I did the documentary, and now I've written a book. And as I did the book, and Scott England's a publisher, and he He's an incredible man. He writes autobiographies on country stars. Mm -hmm. But I told him, well, but I've done a lot of other things besides Hee Haw. Right. And I want my book, Misty Memories, to be able to be sold internationally. Right. But he'd not done that before, <laughs> but he agreed. And now we ship to Rome, we ship to Australia. We had a man in Switzerland buy it. We have people in England buying it. So it's uh, going around the world when I can. It's so tell, very. Go ahead. Tell us a little bit about the process uh, of writing the book, just so that our listeners are, are aware. If you haven't already picked up a copy, um, it's a beautiful 350-page hardcover book. It's filled with you know 225 rare, never-before-seen photos from Misty's collection. So tell us a little bit about the process of writing it. How long did it take? Um, and we've talked to a lot of, of actors who have written their biographies, and they've said that. It was therapeutic, while others said that, well, it brought up things that I really didn't want to remember or didn't want to deal with, but that's part of the process. I think it's both of those. And just so you know, people who have read my book seem to love it, but none of my family will read it. Really? Not one, not one person in my family will read it. I think I would be afraid and to know what somebody might write about me. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> But, you know, the thing is, this book was very different because it was written during a pandemic. Yeah. And the publisher is in Nashville, and I live on a small island in South Carolina. Mm. I live on this wild island with birds, and I have alligators. Wow. <laughs> so he said, well, I'm not coming there, and I don't know how we would do this. Uh, and I said, what about Zoom? Yeah, there you yeah. go, over the so internet. We wrote this book on Zoom three times a week, about an hour or two hours each time, for four months. And he would ask me questions, and then he would come back to them. Because sometimes you're not willing to really open up as far as you should. Right. And I'm so I'm glad I had this publisher because, you know, he lets you know how much you should tell and how much you should pull back and then he said every celebrity I've ever worked with has a box a box of mementos and photos that's somewhere in their attic garage basement that has things from their life mm -hmm. and I want you to find that box perfect <laughs> and I want you to send it to me so <laughs> I, I sent him oh my gosh I sent things from 70 years. <laughs> so wow. Like, and, and I never lie about my age, by the way, because I could give a damn. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you still look good. It doesn't matter. I mean, you're still beautiful. Well, well, thank you. I do walk every day, and I tap dance in the kitchen. Well, uh, be, I don't go to the gym now because everybody's <laughs> wearing a mask. Yeah. And, you know, you can't really huff and puff lifting weights and things with a mask on. Well, I can't. But I have, you know, I'm on an island, and right. I walk on the island. And 
Well, we need to keep that I mean, book selling. Everybody's sort of self-isolating. <laughs> right. right. For sure. Right. We need to keep that book selling so that guy don't get tempted to sell that stuff on eBay. <laughs> because <laughs> that would fetch a pretty penny. Uh, let me ask you about this book. Now, you're talking about he knows how much to pull back and how much to tell and how much not to tell. I can imagine you've got you know some celebrity stories. Have you said anything in the book that any one of your celebrity friends is, was like, I wish you wouldn't have said that? Um, no, but a lot of them have died. Yeah. So, <laughs> unfortunately, I i mean, I have had a great career, and it has lasted a long time. And I've been very blessed that since I was 15 years old, all I had to do was act or sing or dance. And now I write and I direct. And they say that um, only 5% of the Screen Actors Guild can make a living from acting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, actors generally have other jobs. Right. But I never did. I was very blessed. And I wasn't the biggest star, and I wasn't the richest person. But I'll tell you what, I had the most fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, how you got uh, how you got started in the business, um, because I understand that <clears throat> you got started actually at at 15 which you just alluded to so how what was your first inkling into the business I was a dancer behind Sonny and Cher at the <laughs> Teenage Fair on Hollywood Boulevard and how I got there was so crazy because I went on my first date you know I was 15 and my first car date mm-hmm. my parents let you go on a car date with a boy and his name was Bobby and I had on my first pair of heels, and I had on lip gloss. And he, we were going somewhere, and he stopped at a gas station to get gas. And as he got out of the car, he said, you're cute, but you're not as pretty as my last girlfriend. Oh, my God. Well, I need to talk and to you <laughs> about your choice in men, because I, I don't understand. <laughs> well, the thing is, you know, I, would, I was very shy, and, and this just crushed me, you know, and I had long blonde hair, and I had my lip gloss on, and, and he left the radio on when he went to pump the gas, and it was a teen station he had on, mm-hmm. and this announcer came on and said, you too can be a go-go dancer for the world-famous Teenage Fair. Send your picture and name to uh, radio station KBLA in care of Teen Beat Magazine. So I remembered that. And, you know, we didn't have cell phones or things Mm. like that when I was first dating. And when I got home, I got a postcard out, and I got my eighth grade graduation picture (laughs) included. (laughs) (laughs) And I sent it to a Teen Beat magazine, and they called. Wow. And my mother drove me down to Hollywood, because I lived in a a little town called Glendora. Right. Mm -hmm. And... The pride of the foothills. She drove me to the Black Tower on Sunset Boulevard, and there were two thousand girls there to audition. Oh my gosh! And they lined us up in like groups of twenty, and they put a record on, and then you know you dance and dance, and they cut the line and they kept the line, and by the end of the day, I was still there. Wow! Good. And this man walked up to me and he said. Uh, young lady, do you uh, do you have a social security number? And I said, no, but I can get one. What is it? <laughs> I'm only 15. <laughs> I was 15. I didn't know. <laughs> and, and the next week, uh, during Easter vacation, spring break, I was dancing at the Teenage Fair in a tower 50 feet up in the air behind Sonny and Cher, the Bee Gees, and the Young Rascals. Wow. wow. So was that like for a TV show, or was it a live performance? Or? No, it was the Teenage Fair. You have to Google this. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, I don't know what this that is. is. Where, well, this is where Battle of the Bands started. Have ah. you heard that term? Yes. Okay. yes. It was, um, they decided that they would have a fair for teenagers. And, you know, that's when the mini skirt was in mm-hmm. and the long, straight hair. Oh, I love the, the girls people. dancing in the cages back then. I mean, that was a whole thing, you know. Well, I was not in a cage. I was in a tower. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, in my mind, you were and probably... And we had on bell-bottoms and midriffs and, 
uh, we paint hearts on our bellies. You know, <laughs> it's just like we had. I had the long blonde hair. I probably had the look at the time. I, I think maybe this Goldie Hawn stole her act from you, and she did laugh in. You know, because oh like, no, <laughs> I I had a great career because of Goldie Hawn. Really, <laughs> because laugh in. Oh yes, laugh in was so successful, and Goldie had that little voice like this. Mm-hmm. And I had a very high squeaky voice also. But I was in high school when Laugh-In was on. Mm -hmm. But there were two Canadian men, uh, John Ellsworth and Frank Pepiot, and they invented a show called Yeehaw. And they wanted it to be like a a country Mm Laugh-In. And they had uh, done the Smothers Brothers show, and they had done Sonny and Cher, and they wanted to do a country show. That's crazy because I I never realized that because I always said it, it's hee haw in the country. I mean it's laughing in the country. Excuse me. Yeah, that's exactly what yeah, it was. So they said we want to do a country show like laughing. Mm-hmm. We want comedy. We want music. We want singers. We want pretty girls. And they did it. And then I think it was on CBS, and CBS canceled them because it was too bucolic. Yeah, and CBS and, and all the networks had problems with the country shows. I don't know why. Uh huh. But do you know our producers, these young men, mm-hmm. they actually took mortgages out on their homes. Oh, wow. And produced Hee Haw in Nashville, and that's when I was hired. Wow. Now, let me. And I have been working in a cornfield ever since. <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let me ask you, Misty, uh, because knowing. Not only uh, from other interviews that we've seen and heard you in and, and talking to you ourselves and, you know, the fact of writing a book and everything. How did you how did you feel then and how do you feel now about kind of the stereotype that your image was created in? Because between, you know, hee haw and obviously, you know, playing Marilyn Monroe a couple of times, uh, it was very kind of easy for people to stereotype you as kind of like the blonde, airheaded kind of person, but we all know, and anybody who's talked to you knows, that you're not that person. You're a very intelligent, well-spoken person. So did you ever worry about that stereotype? Um, I didn't worry about it, but I asked questions. And I was born in California. My daddy was from the Missouri Ozarks, but I was born in California. And my first day on the off You know, there's a haystack and a hay wagon, and there's like 20 people on set with guitars, and they're playing, and I'm, you know, clapping my hands, and and then they have a break, and I'm sitting there, and, you know, I'm very, very young. I'm the youngest one in the cast, and I'm sitting there on the break, and I say, how come there are no black people on Hee Haw? (laughs) (laughs) And it was like a chill went through the room. (laughs) You know, because I looked around, there were no black people on the set or working behind the cameras. And I was from California, so I thought this was odd. Right. (laughs) But you're you're so like me. I say the same thing. Why was there no black people in the Flintstones? Why was. (laughs) (laughs) When they said, well, we have Charlie Pride. There you go. Oh. But he's like a guest star. He's not like a regular. Right. How can we have no actors that are black who are regulars? Wow. Now, now that was... Then, and, and I kept it up. Yeah. Right. And I brought in pictures of young um, black actresses who could sing and dance, and I gave them to the producer. And uh, he finally said, well... You know what we're going to do? We're going to get a black regular. There you go. And uh, we're going to get uh, Scatman Crothers. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. oh, I love him so much. Yeah. And I loved him, too. Yes. And it, so it was like little seeds I was planting. I, I, I mean, I didn't riot. I didn't march. <laughs> I, I just asked questions. Right. And that's the way it was um, throughout my career. And uh, you'll have to read the book because I did something no other hee haw girl ever did. Boy, that leads to That's speculation. That could have been a lot of things. 
I've, I've got to find that out, Misty Memories. Like, I've got to get the book and got to find out. But he all, I guess, from what I understand, like, everything was on cue cards. And I can imagine there was a lot of ad living. And I guess when you guys messed up, they kept the bloopers in, right? Oh, they did. And uh, Dick Clark and Ed McMahon had a show called uh, the Golden Blooper Awards. Right. And they had us on. And they gave us the Golden Blooper Award. And, <laughs> and Dick Clark handed it to me. So it was really great fun. Fantastic. Really great fun. Well, you got so to can work. Can I tell people where we can buy the book? Oh, absolutely. I want full details. All right. Well, you can buy it on Amazon.com, on Amazon Books. Mm-hmm. But you can also, the book has its own website, mistyrowbook.com. And if you go there, um, you can buy one that's autographed. You can buy a Zoom. My daughter is running the Zoom signings because I can't go to bookstores and sign the books right, right now. Mm-hmm. So we're having book signings. They're five minutes long, and people can see me, and I can see them, and they can actually ask me questions, and they can see me sign the book to them, and I personalize it to them. So that's kind of fun. That's so, very cool. So how many guys ask you to put on the lipstick and kiss the book? Only one. Oh, really? Oh, really? And you know who it was? Who? Do you know who it was? Joe Ark, who is the... Uh, the senior photographer for the Hollywood show, which is a big uh, oh, autograph yes. show yeah. that mm-hmm. goes around the United States. Mm-hmm. And when I was in Chicago doing the Hollywood show about three years ago, he took a picture of me um, for, you know, your badge that lets you in and out of mm-hmm. the building. And I always thought it was such a cute picture because I had my hee jacket on. Mm-hmm. So I contacted him and I said, Joe, could I use this picture in, in Misty Memories on the cover. And he was so happy that I would use it on the cover. And he said, yes, but I want you to send me a book and I want you to sign it and I want lip prints. Right. <laughs> that's exactly how I want to have mine done. That's for sure. Absolutely. Wow. Well, I, I know, you know you've got other things on your website and something I want to ask you about. Uh, because you did a program for children that wound up on DVD, yes. and uh, you have an association with somebody who is, you've been entwined with so many people that I love, and he is the son of the greatest voice artist ever lived, Mel Blank, Noel Blank is his son, and did some voice characterizations for you. Talk about your, your children's program. Uh, it's called Misty's Magical Mountaintop, and it has its own website, and you can go to mistysmagicalmountaintop.com and buy the DVD and it's a wonderful show and Noel Blank who is the son of Mel Blank he does the voice of the magic phone Mm -hmm. and another thing in my book I talk about is Noel Blank discovered me wow now, how did how did and that happen? We have can, can we get well, a little have story? You to read the book. I okay. can't tell you everything. <laughs> but I, I was very young, sitting in a coffee shop in Hollywood, and I lived at the Hollywood Studio Club, which is like the Y, mm-hmm. but it's just for girls. And uh, Mrs. Selznick had uh, founded it because it was for girls between seventeen and twenty-five who wanted to be uh, actresses or dancers or singers. Mm -hmm. And you paid $25 a week and you got breakfast and you got dinner, no lunch. You shared another room with a girl and they only allowed girls there, no men. Right. And they locked the doors at 10 o'clock at (laughs) night. (laughs) So it was, um, I had a small scholarship and I went to the actor's workshop. Right. And... But I had no money, and uh, I was rehearsing a scene with a guy from the Actors' Workshop. But I couldn't let him in to the Hollywood Studio Club because they don't allow him in there. Right. right. And so we met at a coffee shop to go through our, our lines for the scenes we were going to do in class. And Noel Blank happened to be in that coffee shop. And he saw kind of a sleazy photographer come up to me and ask if I wanted to be a playboy. And and I said, oh, no, thank you. I'm an actress. So Noel came up after. He said, are you serious? Do you want to be an actress? I said, yes. 
I go to the actor's workshop. And he took out a pen, and on the back of a card, he said, I have a friend who runs a commercial agency. His name is Jack Wormser. Mm -hmm. You go see him, and you tell him that no blank sent you. Wow. And I did. And I didn't even have money to put the gas in my car to drive <laughs> off agent's office. I, I walked up all these hills to get there because it was on Highland. And they signed me. The Jack Wormser agency signed me. And I got so many commercials from them. And I didn't see Noel again for about 17 years. Wow. And he's just such a nice man. And I'm really good friends with his wife, Catherine. Everybody calls her Cat. Right. And she writes books. So, it, you know, my life has been blessed by many people who helped me along the way. One of your commercials I saw was for grapefruit. I used to live in the Indian River uh, area of Florida. And, you did? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was my very first commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe how you go? Coffee tear, grapefruit, coffee tear, grapefruit. <laughs> well, I, I've got to ask you, because I love this movie. Ferd and Beverly Sebastian are friends of ours. And, uh, you know, it's... Really? It's, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it, is a, it is a B movie, but I, I think The Hitchhikers is a really great film. Uh, that was your first movie, right? Yes. <laughs> and I talk about them in Misty Memory. Oh, I'm so glad I say it, said nice things about them now. Because <laughs> I'll tell you, it could have gone either way, because Ferd's kind of a laid-back guy, but Beverly, she's a hoot, boy. She's like, I, I refer to them as the Ma and Pa Kettle of filmmaking. Because <laughs> are, can, I, can I ask you, are they still alive? Oh, yes, yes they're still yes. alive. And uh, uh, Ferd, is, Ferd is now a, pa a pastor, and he uh, runs a... Uh, a program where he goes to prisons to preach and pray with prisoners and try to help rehabilitate them and uh, Bev is running a greyhound rescue organization um, to to save greyhounds that have basically been put out to pasture or for euthanasia, euthanization after they're retired from racing well you, this makes my heart so happy to one know that they're still alive yeah. mm -hmm. two know that they're still together yes but Three, do you know she was the one who wanted me in the movie? Really? And yes, it. you have to read the book because she saw my picture. I had no photographs to go interviews on. So that sleazy photographer who wanted me in Playboy, right. he said, well, if you won't pose for Playboy, I'll take a picture of your face. you got a great face, kid. You know, mm -hmm. so I said, well, if you take the pic, I don't have any money to give you for the photograph. And he said, uh, you don't need money. I'll take the picture if you let me put it in my window of my photography studio. Hmm. So I said, yes, if I could have an eight by 10 of it. So it worked out great because then I had an eight by 10 to go to auditions with. He blew up the picture of my face up like four or five feet tall. Mm hmm. And she saw it. Oh, wow. And Bev had, Bev had just written a script called The Hitchhikers. Right. About a young teenage runaway named Maggie. And she was walking by that photographer's studio, saw that picture, and she said, <laughs> Third, that's our girl. That's there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll have to send you their phone number because they'd probably love to hear from you. Well... Gee, it's been so many decades since I've <laughs> seen them. But that was my first movie, and that was before Hee Haw. Right. Yeah. right. Well, I'm glad you so acknowledge it. because that was about a year before Hee Haw. It, it was a good movie. It was a good movie, definitely. And and let me tell you. Really? Okay, yeah. I, had, I had not seen... Uh, your your debut in the Marilyn Monroe movie until Thursday. It took me this many years to find it. And first of all, I'm a oh Larry. <laughs> first of all, I'm a Larry Buchanan fan. I love Larry Buchanan. I think he was an incredible director. Did you see Goodbye Norma Jean? No, we, we, we saw Goodbye Norma Jean, but we have not been able to find Goodnight Sweet Marilyn. Apparently, like that's like a lost film. You can't. It's not on DVD. It's not on streaming anywhere. You you can't find it. We found a twelve dollar videotape well, on on eBay, but that's it. You can't find it nowhere. But, you know, the thing is, I did not do Good Night, Sweet Marilyn. He wanted me to do it, and I didn't do it. Also, it's um, in, like, flashbacks that you're in there? Or? 
Yes, the Screen Actors Guild called me and they said, Misty, we screened this movie called Goodnight Sweet Marilyn. You were not paid to do it. There's no contract with you on this film. Oh. And you're 80% of it. Oh. Mm. <laughs> That's not very nice of um, them. Wow. Well, you know, I was pregnant at the time, so I wasn't going to be playing Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. <laughs> but I just, I was kind of disappointed in the first film. Really? Because it got too, it got really rough for me. Mm. And, um... I went to the Cannes Film Festival with it. I went to London and met Elton John and Madame Tussauds let me, uh, they let me model the seven year itch dress, the real one that Marilyn wore. They wow. had it in the museum. That and, had to be a real know, experience. A wow. And all that is in the book with pictures. You know, the first night I met Elton John uh -huh. and me in the seven year itch dress. And, um, you know, I, very blessed that the book has so many pictures and so many people but starting out was rough for me because I had no money you know I just barely made it through mm -hmm. high school and I had a dream and I wanted to be on TV I wanted to be in movies and I studied and I, I went to the actors workshop then I studied with Stella Adler right. and I studied and studied and things came through for me I was able to audition and I starved I mean I lived on cornflakes and ketchup soup for a long time and uh, you know that's what you do when you have a dream and you love something well I'm a drive-in movie nut and and it was more kind of like a B movie not as much mainstream as a lot of the others but the one thing about it that was really good is, is you really are an incredible actress. I was never really a fan of Marilyn Monroe until I saw the film. You made me feel her. I, I felt so bad about all the things that she'd went through because everybody was taking advantage of her and, and just she's being raped constantly throughout the film. And you you really caught that emotion and, and made me feel empathy for her. And, and you really should have received some kind of an award for that film because that was one of the most... It was the best portrayal of... of and, of course, you were Norma Jean starting out before she became Marilyn. But that was the most incredible portrayal of Marilyn Monroe I've ever seen. Thank you. Oh, I that loved it. That means so much to me. Thank you. Because when it came out, it did very well at the box office. Uh, and I actually got... Um, it was a low-budget movie, of course. Yeah. But they were making them in the 70s, these independent sure. films. Mm -hmm. And I had to uh, screen test for it with some other actresses. And I went through quite a bit to get that film. And I actually got a really good review from it, from Variety and several other places. But it, it was tough on me showing what she went through. Right. Yeah. And it was rougher than I thought it would be. Well, was it hard on um, you in, in knowing it was like your first role and you were the star and, and then there was a lot of nudity? Was that hard for you to do that? or? Oh, uh, that was just so hard. And and he wanted more. Yeah. And I, I well, said, that's, no, that's Larry no, Buchanan. That. <laughs> and, uh, and he actually dubbed my voice at the end of the film. I didn't say that line. Oh, really? It seemed like it wasn't in the script and I refused to say it. Mm-hmm. He dubbed it in with a, a Marilyn kind of voice yeah. actress, and they didn't tell me about that line. Oh, I, my God. I was at the Cannes Film Festival, and at the premiere of my film, that line came up. Are you talking about the line and where yeah, you, you say you will never yeah, blank yes. like yeah, another? Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's not say that Okay. On <laughs> yes, that one. That yeah. one. And there I am in an evening gown, the star of the film, and Universal Pictures is there. And this line comes up, and I just got out, and I ran out of the theater. Oh, that mm -hmm. you know, me. It was, just, it was devastating to me. Yeah. And, um, um, you know, but I went to the Cannes Film Festival. I went to Australia. I went to London. I went to MIFED in Italy uh, for their film festival. So I got to go around the world with this film. And it actually was my second film. It was my second starring role mm -hmm. because The Hitchhikers was my first. Oh, that's right. Yes, my, absolutely. How dare I forget? Yeah, yes. And um, I, the L.A. Times actually gave me a good review for The Hitchhikers. And I remember 
I, I cut it out of the paper. And when I went in, because you know you didn't have the internet then, you yeah. you just didn't digitally send things. Right. I take the picture of my name on the marquee and my little review when I went to interviews, and you had this portfolio of mm-hmm. pictures of you, and I would show them that review, and that review got me an interview for Hee Haw. Perfect. Wow. Well, I, I hope to God because you know I never really realized that, that Marilyn uh, and you know, of course, she was born as Norma Jean Baker, but I never realized that she had went through so much casting couch harassment. I pray to God that that didn't happen to you in your career because. Oh, my mother would never have allowed that. <laughs> well, good for her. Good for her. My I'm, mother was a devout Catholic. She used to drive me to <laughs> interview some things. And then when I moved to Hollywood, my dad wouldn't let me live anywhere but the Hollywood Studio Club, which didn't allow any of it. And I had all these little odd jobs while I was uh, going to the actor's workshop. I was a French fry flipper one time. called <laughs> 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 the French fry <laughs> You know, you, you struggle and you go through these crazy things. I I once worked at the snack bar at Go Kart of America, and Paul Newman was there when I was ten years old to to learn how to drive a go kart. Mm-hmm. And he he bought a Coke, and he left um, he left he paid for the Coke, but he left ten cents on the counter. And I jumped over that counter and I ran after him and I said, "Excuse me, sir, but you left this." dime there and he said no dear that was for you oh, oh. Nice you know, and, I, and I'm I was 10 years old I really didn't know how great Paul Newman was yeah. but that was my first tip well wow, that's cool <laughs> so knowing that you'd done all this stuff I guess you had experience when you flipped french fries on Donnie Most on, on, <laughs> <laughs> on happy days oh with Wendy the car hop yeah, yeah yes <laughs> I just had to serve the food I didn't have to make it but I did my claim to fame on Happy Days as Wendy's car hop is when Potsy kisses me and I dump two hot fudge sundaes on. Yes. <laughs> and they, they kept that in the titles for the second year. Wow. And I became very good friends with Don Most, Donnie Most. And we were actually going to tour this year, but then the pandemic hit. Right. Donnie has a big band and he's a great singer and we ran into each other oh after 35 years and he asked me to come do duets with him so I said oh but I you know Donnie I do country music and I do funny things and mm-hmm. he said well just wear a nice dress and come do a duet with me Perfect. I said okay so I went and I wore my Marilyn Monroe dress, the <laughs> not the seven-year itch one, right. but the pink one, right. and I sang Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend, so <laughs> and people loved it. Perfect. And Perfect. they didn't care that I was older now because they were older too, but people remembered that era and how much fun it was. You, you had a and couple I, of, uh, go ahead. I, I just love dressing up in Marilyn's pink dress. <laughs> I, I think Marilyn would be very proud that you were portraying her because you did an incredible job. But you, you had a couple of times where you, you worked with actors again because one of my favorite shows when, when I was growing up, I'm only like six years younger than you, uh, was when things were rotten. And I love that the Mel Brooks oh. Robin Hood series. And there was an actor that you <clears throat> excuse me, acted with in that show that you wound up acting with again in the love boat. Yes. A Bernie. Yes. Bernie Capel. Yeah. And I tell a very funny story about him in the book because he's such a gentleman. And, and um, <clears throat> <clears throat> yes, the casting couch was out there, but I was just like running away from it as fast as I could. Oh, good for <laughs> and you. Bernie, <laughs> Bernie helped me one time when a guy came on one of my co-stars came on to me too much and he said I'll see you in your trailer later <laughs> <laughs> and Bernie 
Bernie heard that, and he said, I'm taking care of this right now. Oh, good And for him. he went into my trailer, and when that man knocked on the door, Bernie had this really um, frilly undergarment. He waved it out the w- window, and he goes, come on in, sweetheart. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> He's and awesome. he just, he just um, protected me, you know? Right. He protected me. So I was very young on when things were rotten. Uh, but gosh, I got to work with some of the greatest comics in history. Yes, said Caesar. Caesar. <laughs> One week, and then uh, Mel Brooks, he flew in Marty Feldman to direct me in an episode they wrote for me called Those Wedding Bell Blues. Now, I've got to ask about and him because I love him so much. You've worked with so many people that I love. Marty Feldman was a crazy genius. Yes, he was. Yeah. And he directed me in that to an Arab dealing in salad oil who was supposed to uh, <laughs> marry Maid Marion, and that was Dudley Moore. Right. Yeah. Wow. You know? <laughs> so I got to work with all these great people, and, and one uh, weekend, Paul Williams came in, you know, the songwriter. Right, And yeah. he was with the Merry Men, and when he get bored, you know, during a, a break, he'd form a conga line. And then he'd start, <laughs> he'd start singing, in the mountain greenery where... And he'd go, come on, maid, you know, to Maid Mary and right. me, right. and I'd get in the conga line. And, I mean, we just did these crazy things, and it was so much fun. Well, it was a Mel Brooks and, uh, yeah, set. Yeah, I was going to say, expect. I am I am not disappointed to hear that, that Mel Brooks' is ex- a set from him is exactly what you would think it would be. <laughs> I know because they have this thing called craft services, you know, the people that bring in all the food for right. you. Right. And I had to be there at six o'clock in the morning uh, because, you know, I had all this hair and makeup and I had this wonderful wardrobe, these gorgeous gowns and craft services with uh, bring in things. And I had never seen a bagel. <laughs> <laughs> And so I walked up to the craft service table and I picked it up and I said, where's the icing on this donut? <laughs> <laughs> and, and Mel is like, boy, hey, we got a guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's so you know, great. That they had to, Mel had to show me the proper way to eat a bagel. <laughs> and and what better than to be taught by the king of the Jews? Because he definitely is. He's incredible. And thank God he's still around. I mean, he's still with us. It's incredible. But, but what definitely. a blessing that was. That yeah. was like a, a jewel in the crown of my career. And there's yet another I'm, person that you got to work with after working with him originally. You worked with her on Hee Haw. And in the Love Boat, you got to work again with Minnie Pearl. And I've got to ask about Minnie Pearl. Well, she was my mentor yeah, on Hee Haw. I bet. And she, when I was very young, she gave me what for when I was I was too shy to talk to one of my fans. <laughs> and uh, she marched in the dressing room. She goes, don't you ever treat a fan up like that again or you won't have any. You know what I mean? <laughs> and she sat me down and, and taught me how to deal with fans. And when I lost my baby, she told me some stories of her and Henry, her husband, and she gave me advice on marriage, on love. You know, I heard that. I heard that she was like a mother to everybody. Yes, but I worked with her, of all the girls, I probably worked with her more because we did things away from Hee Haw. Mm -hmm. Well, I was in the schoolhouse set where Minnie was the teacher and I was one of the children. But then we went on the Hee Haw Road Show Mm -hmm. with Buck Owens and Minnie Pearl and me and uh, George Lindsay. And then we did a Knott's Berry Farm. We did a huge concert there with Roy Clark and Roy Acuff and Minnie Pearl and me. And then Minnie and I were on the Johnny Cash special together. I know. And they dressed me up as Minnie Pearl. (laughs) <laughs> and they dressed uh, <laughs> uh, June June Carter Cash. They dressed her up as Minnie Pearl, <laughs> and we imitated Minnie Pearl. And we'd go out to the opera and go howdy, and you know June would go howdy, and then Minnie would come in and go howdy hell, 
<laughs> she was the, the the real mini. And then when a love boat called, uh, there was a two hour love boat. It was about a country music cruise, and mm-hmm. Tanya Tucker was on it. Mm-hmm. Minnie Pearl was on it, and I got to play her niece. Oh. And every time I was on Love Boat, I was always the love interest uh, of Bernie Capel. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky him. <laughs> wow. I've got to ask one other show, uh, Fantasy Island. Now, that's a fun show. Did you have any encounters with Hervé Vilches? I heard he loved the ladies. Oh, well, I worked with him. I did four of them. And um, Ricardo Montbon, mm-hmm. um, he, uh, the last Fantasy Island I did, he directed me. Mm-hmm. And it was quite wonderful. And, you know, it was just a magical show. And in the beginning, they didn't shoot it on the lot at one of the studios. They shot it at the um, Pasadena Arboretum. Mm-hmm. It was a beautiful, beautiful place. You know, the tower mm-hmm. where Tattoo says, the plane, the plane. <laughs> right. And we'd shoot it outside. And I loved working for Aaron Spelling oh, yeah. on the love boat. He was a giant and, of television back then. Yeah. Yes, and, and Arthur Rowe produced Fantasy Island. And, uh, you know, Spelling used me on so many shows. I did Aloha Paradise with uh, Debbie Reynolds, and I got to go to Hawaii for three weeks. So that Ooh. was kind of kicky. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess so you're. It's a good thing I did all these things because what can you do now? <laughs> right. I know. Right. You know. I wanted to find out because I guess you said in an interview that of all the TV things you did, you did a whole lot of them. Love American Style, one of my favorite shows. But I guess you really like doing Airwolf with Jan Michael Vincent and Ernest Borgnine. We love Jan Michael Vincent. He was incredible. That was my favorite part that I ever did on TV. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called Out of the Sky. Mm -hmm. And it was a huge part for me. And they shot it at Universal. And they actually built a set. Because an outdoor set that said Roxy on it. Um, to do the concert, and they actually took me up in the Airwolf, the Big Mama. Oh wow! Boy, is that thing powerful! And Jan Michael Vincent was very nice to me, and Ernest Borgnine had been on Hee Haw, so I already knew him. And he used to run lines with me on the back lot, and he he was a great guy. But I loved the role of Roxy. Yeah. Well, before before we wrap this up, Misty, I have to ask because I know that Terry will forever regret it if if we don't ask because he was a huge fan of both uh, Buck Owens and Roy Clark. Um, so, can you tell us a little bit about? Obviously, we know what they came off as on screen, but what were those two men like in, in real life and on set? I guess they were very different. They were very different. And Buck was kind of crazy funny, you know, and, and, and you have to read my book, Misty Memories, because he did something I did not expect. And, and Roy Clark and I, um, I worked with Roy off and on screen for many, many years, and I did a Lifetime Achievement Award for him, and then I spoke um, at Sam Lovello's memorial, and Roy was there, and you know, Roy could always make me laugh. And he was also an actor. He was not only a fine singer, and he could play almost any instrument, but he was a wonderful comic actor. Sure. And we used to do a lot of skits and things together, and we used to do a lot of appearances together. So I will never forget them. And I think when you have had the kind of career I've had, to work with so many greats mm-hmm. I wanted to write it down yes I I wanted to remember them and honor them and there's lots of pictures in the book of Roy Clark and Buck Owens and the Hee Haw Girls and uh, just you know even <clears throat> you know happy days and when things were rotten and Mel Brooks and 
and me as Marilyn Monroe and, and, and meeting Elton John. I mean, there's so many wonderful things. And my daughter was right. If there ever comes a time where I can't remember, she can read the book to me. But she will also have it. Because yes. she told me, she was born after my TV career. So she never knew the kind of things I had done. You know, we might be at a place in a store sometime and they go, oh, Misty Rover, you know. And she had no idea what they were talking about as a child. Right. So now it's all in the book. <laughs> well, uh, again, uh, for listeners, you can check out the book. Just head over to MistyRowBook.com. Also, Misty's uh, main official website is over at MistyRow.com. Uh, Misty, knowing that, that you have written and directed uh, plays, I mean, you, you even directed and starred in Always Patsy Cline for a while, and now you have this great book, Misty Memories, any ideas of, of course, after the pandemic being over, of taking it and turning it into some kind of a one-woman show? Well, actually, I had a show at the Metropolitan Room in New York, and I told stories about my career and showed pictures and sang songs, and it kind of developed into this book. Oh. And I will be directing, hopefully, again. I The last time I worked, like so many people, was in March, March 1st. Right at the American Music Theater. I directed and starred in Always Patsy Klein. I'm the comic in that. I'm the storyteller. And I work with all the great Patsy singers. So even though I did Hee Haw for 19 years, <laughs> are you sitting down? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I have done Always Patsy Klein for 24 years. Wow. wow. And I have directed it professionally for 20 years. Wow. Well, I'm glad to hear you're not so, one of these actors or celebrities that get bored and like, I've done this for three years. I want to move on or give me more money. You're just happy to work. And, and that's, that's a good thing. Yes. I, oh, I love to work. And the great thing about stage is the people that saw me on TV and in movies, I didn't get to see them. Yeah. But when I do stage, uh, you know, I go out into the foyer after and I sign autographs and I pose for pictures with people. I get to meet the people that made my career. Yeah, you even write and people back, like the, the fans write you and you write them back. Oh, uh, yes. On uh, Facebook, I have thousands of fans and they ask me things and, I, you know, they're keeping me occupied. <laughs> 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 so I post pictures, and they react right away, and they tell me things they remembered about uh, shows I had done. And it's a wonderful thing to go down memory lane. And when they buy my book, I say, oh, could you take a picture of you with a book and post it on Facebook? And they do. Um, so I get to see the person who bought my book. That's cool. And that's just so thrilling to me. You know, I, I'm making friends at this part of my life when I've done all these movies and TV shows and stage shows and the people who saw them are becoming friends with me. When you meet people in person, do anybody, do people ever bring up your Playboy issue? You did an iconic Playboy spread. It was the issue with Jimmy Carter did an interview in the magazine. Uh, do you ever sign those? Um, I signed some at the Hollywood show, but the Hollywood show, they charge for your autograph, mm -hmm. and then people get a picture. With the, but they charge for your autograph because they know people bring things. And then you know, they, bring, <laughs> they bring posters of Goodbye Norma Jean. Right. They bring a Playboy. They bring a, a book that my name's in. One man even brought, this is the strangest thing, I had this star that said Misty Rowe in it. And it was in the uh, around my pool, you know. Uh -huh. So when you get out of the pool, I had a house in Greenwich, Connecticut with a pool. Mm -hmm. You get out of the pool and you step on the star. Right. So it's a nice flat area. Well, he went there when after I sold the house and moved away. 13 years later, he shows up at an autograph show with my star really what? and he said i heard they were redoing your pool and i went over there and i got the star 
<laughs> and he actually gave it to me. And now it's out front in my sidewalk. Oh, nice. Oh, wow. In oh, nice. front of my house. So, and I posed for a picture with him with the star. Yeah. And, but I thought for someone to remember me for 13 years and then show up uh, in New Jersey at an autograph show, I was at Chiller. That was yeah. it. Yeah. Well, Chiller. is it just refreshing yeah. when somebody like you shows the love back? Because that means a lot. To, to people like us, admire people that, that have done stuff in showbiz. There's some that don't, you know, and I've had some bad experiences myself. You know, a show that I watched, you know, since I was eight years old and grown up, and then you talk to them later, and they're very rude, and it just, it's like finding out there's no Santa Claus. Well, you feel like you've wasted a lot of time that you've invested yeah, you know, into just, loving something so yeah. much. Oh, I'm so sorry, yeah. but I feel I would not have had the career I had and the memories I had without people who watched yeah. me on TV and right. movies who who bought my DVDs and who are now buying my book I mean that is your career they they made you right yeah I've got to ask you that maybe why the, would you be rude to them I don't understand <laughs> that at all I've got to ask you unless the time frame was, was wrong one of your cast members on Hee Haw I, she's the girl that Elva should have married Linda Thompson okay I don't know if she was going with Elvis at the time she did Hee Haw, but did Elvis ever show up there? I mean, did you ever meet him? Uh, no, no. He wanted to come, um, but uh, Colonel Parker wouldn't let him. Oh, that's too but bad. But you're talking about Linda Thompson. Yes. Right. And she, by the time she was on Hee Haw, uh, she was no longer dating Elvis. Oh, I think okay. they went out like five years. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Hee Haw was notorious for beautiful girls. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Let's not forget had, Barbie Benton. Well, Barbie was my best friend for five years. Yeah. And then Marianne, when Barbie left the show, I became best friends with Marianne. Uh, Gordon, who met Kenny Rogers on the set of Hee Haw. Yep. And then married him. Uh, so, and she was my um, maid of honor. And my wedding to the soap opera star wow. who ran away. Right. <laughs> well, knowing how Barbie had that great connection with Hugh Hefner, and there's another marriage that should have happened. I wish they would have gotten married, but unfortunately they didn't. What oh, did... no. No, no. They, she married someone in, like, 1978 that she's still married to, George. Yeah. Oh, good. George Grotto. But what did... What did and uh... they have a... Be- Go ahead. They have a beautiful home in Aspen. Perfect. It's beautiful. Well, I'm glad she's happy and, and things turned and, out. I wanted to find yeah, out I what... see her from time to time. Pat, perfect. What does she think your Playboy thing? Because, like, she was in Playboy so much and, and did beautiful photos. Did she like what they did with you, with, with the great spread you did? Because it was beautiful photos. Well, thank you. Um, I talk about that in my book, too. Barbie is the reason I was in Playboy, because she made me do it. I, I was thinking so. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that probably happened. I, I I'm kind of a shy person yeah. when it comes to that and I was so shy I made them get a female photographer mm-hmm. Seuss Randall and um, I made them shoot it at my home and they brought a lighting man to do the lights you know Right. and I came out in a rope from my bedroom and I looked at this guy hanging lights in my house I said oh no he can't be here <laughs> You know, he's got to go sit on the front porch right. before I take this robe off. And it was like, they never had anybody pose like that before. So. <laughs> well, it Good for you. turned out yeah. beautiful, and, and I'm glad you did it, because I know you're you're shy and down to earth, but, but it's art. Playboy's art is nothing to be ashamed of, for sure, and, and, and I'm glad you're not. It's great photos. Oh, well, thank you. Well, Jimmy Carter was in it, and... and you know, it's a very famous issue. Right. Yeah. Right. It's very famous. And and when people ask me about Playboy, I said, yes, I was in Playboy with Jimmy Carter, <laughs> but he wore more clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Better to be in Playboy with Jimmy Carter than uh, uh, the guy that was hanging out with Monica Lewinsky, you know. Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton. So. <laughs> so 
All right. Well, Misty, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us this weekend. We encourage our listeners, again, check out the book. The book is called Misty Memories, and you can head over to mistyrowbook.com. Also, check out Misty's main website at mistyrow.com. Um, and thank you not only for joining us, but thank you for all the entertainment over the years. I mean, you've had an amazing career. You even did little Abner with Joe Namath. That's incredible. <laughs> Never, I never. did, yeah. and if you get my book, you'll see Joe in there and, and hear some real funny stories. I bet. He, he's, <laughs> when he's we work together. long as I don't read Thank something. Thank you too, so much. Absolutely. It's, it's been a pleasure, and, and I'm so glad you sound just like yourself. I love your voice. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much. All right. Thank okay. you, Missy. Have a great rest of your weekend. Good night. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.